Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on business planning in uncertain times. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under the Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray. I'm the Project Manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage Programme. This is actually our last webinar of the Ways Out of Crisis theme of webinars, but we're pleased to announce that our next series of webinars will be launching imminently and will be on the theme of finding time. Running January to March next year, we'll have webinars that look at taking stock of the year that has been and thinking about the way forward, as well as specialist sessions on well-being and accessibility for your staff and volunteers. Booking will be going live soon, so please do sign up to our mailing list to be the first to receive the full details. A little bit of housekeeping for you about today's session. Audience members, your cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout. Today's session will start with a presentation and we've allowed some time for Q&A, so please Please do add questions into the Q&A box. The chat is switched on. Say hello, interact with your fellow attendees and do let us know about any tech issues. We do have live captioning available for you today so you can access that via your Zoom menu. We will be recording today's session and it will be made available on our website afterwards. A little bit for you about the Rebuilding Heritage Programme. We're providing training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We're offering free resources such as today's webinar, which will be openly available online, as well as one-to-one -one and group support, which you can access by application. We are currently open for applications and the deadline is the 16th of December at 11pm. So please, please get your applications into us. You can apply for one, some or all the types of support. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to fill out the application and um, you'll be delivered, support will be delivered in January and February of next year. The support on offer for this round is up to eight hours of business planning consultancy with Creative United who are delivering our webinar today, a media and communication strategy session and follow-up session with Media Trust, fundraising consultancy with the Chartered Institute of Fundraising, a place on rebuilding leadership training with Claw Leadership, and new for this round, a place on managing wellbeing training. Please, please do apply. You can also now follow us on Twitter at heritage underscore RH. Please use the hashtag rebuilding heritage. Now, on to the session itself. I am delighted to introduce you to Louise Emerson of Take the Current, who works with organisations on their business plans and strategies, and she is also an accredited coach. Louise joins us on behalf of our business and enterprise partner on the programme, Creative United. Over to you, Louise. Hi, and welcome everybody to this afternoon's session. Um, we are going to start the session by getting a little bit of a feeling about where you are at the moment. So we've just got a question for you and we're going to launch the poll now. I know some of you may have difficulty seeing it. Um, often some people do have. So what I'll do is once the poll is launched, I will read it out to you so that everybody can be thinking about it, even if you can't take part in it. So the first, you've got four options. The first option is stressed and frustrated. The second option, tired and worn down. The third option, getting a bit more hopeful now, experimental and creative. And the fourth option, hopeful and energetic. So please just tell us which one of those you think expresses best how you're feeling at the end of this rather difficult year that we've had. I'll just give you a few minutes just so as everybody um, can vote. Okay, so if most of the votes have come in, let's see what the results are. Oh, wow. We've got a lot of you feeling tired and worn down. And I must say, I am not wholly surprised about that. But there are a significant amount of you that are coming up the other side of that curve, beginning to experiment, uh, try things out beginning to get a little bit of hope um, as we say goodbye to 2020 and we start looking forward into 21, which has to be a more hopeful year. So thank you very much for doing that. That's really um, helpful. So you've probably seen this before, but those questions are related to this graph, um, which I'm sure you've seen in other webinars. 
Um, and this kind of area where we have got a lot of people is sometimes called the Valley of Despair, <laughs> quite aptly, because um, you've all been through quite a lot. And actually, we're still in a fairly uncertain time, even at the moment. So today is all about helping you to think about coming up the other side of this curve about rethinking what you're going to be doing in 2021 and how you're going to do that. So I hope that will help you to start uh, seeing a little bit of a glimmer of uh, light at the end of the tunnel. So today what we're going to do is help you with starting to think about how you revisit your business plan and we have assumed that you've got a business plan of course. Um, but even if you are at this webinar and you haven't got a business plan, I think you still find value in this, even if you're starting from scratch. So just going to look at who is involved. I think given the results of the poll, just looking at that dealing with ambiguity, dealing with uncertainty, we're going to spend most of our time looking at the business of reviewing your business plan. And a little bit of time at the end, I know a lot of people have been thinking about scenario planning. We're going to spend a little bit of time at the end looking at that. And then we've got your questions. So please, at, towards the end, do ask your questions in the chat so that we can um, have some direct answers for you. So who is revisiting the business plan? And I'm really aware that there'll be a number of people here today that probably feel that they are one woman bands, one man bands, and they've only got themselves. But I would um, suggest to you that you need to do this with others. If you've got a team, get your team involved. If you are on your own, do you have volunteers or do you have you know, trusted advisors that you work with? But it's really important, I think, not to set off on a journey of your own when you're really looking at a business plan. And the reason why I say that is that in uncertain times, you really need to build in flexibility and adaptability into whatever you're doing because you just don't have all the answers. Um, and in bringing people along with you, what you're helping do is you're helping them to see how decisions are made. You're helping them to see what you don't know um, and what will change the decisions you make. So as you move along, they're seeing the dynamism of that. And in so doing that, then you're empowering them. You're helping motivate them because they're part of it. And actually it helps you if we've got any people that are heading up organizations today um, or chairs of, of trusts, it helps you not to be so isolated as well. So you're bringing people along with you and that creates more understanding. Now, I think a lot of people would think, oh, but it's much quicker if we just take the business plan out, get the pen out and go through it quickly ourselves and get it sorted out. And for sure, that is quicker, much quicker. Um, but I know from experience that further down the line, you spend the time trying to bring people back in with you. And you leave yourself a little bit more vulnerable. You're taking all the decisions on your own with only your own information. So you just don't have the same kind of buy-in. So if you can, I would bring people along with you. And those of you teams will know how important this is. So we've said it's had, this is probably the most pessimistic slide of the whole um, seminar. It's been a hard year and, you know, it still is a hard year. We're still kind of asking ourselves, really, when, when will this end? Even though we are beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I know a lot of you will be in teams or with teams who uh, have been decimated, perhaps. Uh, fewer people, maybe people doing more than one job now. Uh, volunteers who still maybe can't come back to work. So a lot of change actually in the culture and the team and those teams that are there are perhaps still working from home and um, remote. And I know at the very start of all this, there was a lot of worry about a reputation, about, you know, we're closed. Do people know that we're going to open again? Do they worry about us never opening again? Those of you who've had capital projects and big plans for, um, changing your organizations this year will have seen those mostly being frozen for a year 
and wondering, is that going to come back and is the timing still right? So lots of worries there about capital projects as well. And of course, income generation, after all the hard work of generating income from events and programs and schools programs and your visitor income was just dashed really quickly overnight. And of course, there's also um, the horizon. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with um, with cuts uh, to, if you're working in a local authority organization, what will happen there and what will happen to other kinds of funding. And I know there has been a funding seminar, but still the jury's out on the how some of those funds will come back and what the conditions will be of funding going forward. But one thing is really hopeful actually, is that when, organize, when people were surveyed, when they came, when you were allowed to go back out and visit things for a short amount of time, what happened was that actually heritage sites were the most visited when people were allowed to go out again. I think that is really hopeful. And this is part of a survey that was done by Baker Richards, One Further and Indigo. And we're going to pop the uh, link to that in the chat because the survey is full of really good information which you can use in your business planning. I'm going to use one of their slides later on as well, but it's excellent and it looks at uh, use of digital and a whole lot of other things as well. So I think you find that very useful. So what about the future then? I think there are things to look forward to. You know, um, it's proven, if we didn't need it to be proven to us, we probably didn't, but the importance of heritage. I think there was some at the start, back in March, people were wondering, you know, what's my relevance working in a heritage organization when there's so much uh, concentration on the health of the nation. But it's really clear that people really value heritage. And there is a lot of opportunity in terms of how much collaboration has been going on. So more than ever at the moment, people are willing to share information. People are starting to think about how they change what they do. A lot of heritage organizations are thinking about changing their services and they're talking to other people about sharing services. So, you know, is there another organization that does similar things to you and you can change, you can deliver part of it and they can deliver part of it and you concentrate on the areas where you're strongest. And I know some organizations are doing that at the moment. And one thing that has really come to the fore for everybody through this is the local agenda. And a lot of the people who are attending today will know their local area better than anyone. And that is going to be really important going forward. Those organizations who were well connected locally came out of this much better than organizations that weren't. And actually, when you look at the big organizations at the moment, it's really interesting because they don't know their local areas. They don't know the people that live around them. And they're having to partner with smaller organizations who are well connected. So local agenda is going to really come to the fore. And I think with all the heritage agendas that are across the UK, it's going to be really important connecting in with business and community. And that well-being agenda as well, there was a really good report uh, that came out a few months ago about well-being and heritage. I know we don't need to tell you about that because you know it, you know, you know the power of volunteering, um, the power of activity, uh, connecting mindfulness through the things that heritage organisations do. And there is starting to be some more money coming out for that kind of activity. And you guys are really well placed to access that whether it's through social prescribing. And I think there's a fund at the moment, we're going to pop that in the chat as well. Um, thriving Communities, I think it is through the Arts Council at the moment, it's still open, I think, till next week to apply for those monies. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. People are realizing how much they can, uh, their knowledge can be used um, in terms of training, in terms of workshops. A lot of organizations flipped into doing that digitally and were able to actually make money out of that. It's one of the areas where people are much more willing to pay because they, they get the connection between going to a workshop and paying for it better than they do accessing some other content um, digitally. And of course, schools are going to start opening up again. 
um, and that those programs will be re rejuvenated again. And then, you know, just this week, we've seen vaccinations starting to happen. That's going to be rolling out now over the next four, six months. And that will really change the landscape for all of us. And there's money starting to come into town recovery plans as well. Um, so, you know, that is also something, if you're well connected locally, that you can be part of. I think there was a stat that I read yesterday about something like 80% of the Arts Council's funded organisations are five minutes away from a high street. So that's just how important you are to bringing people back into the high street. So I just want to spend a short amount of time before we get into the nitty gritty of the business, revisiting the business plan, to kind of, especially for those 60% of you who are, you know, feeling a bit worn down by the end of this year. So much uncertainty, so much ambiguity, um, not really being able to see your future, which is really, really unsettling. And in a few little exercises here, I just want to um, try to help you becoming more comfortable being uncomfortable, because that is really the key to living in uncertain times. And you will know this um, set of quadrants from the Donald Rumsfeld uh, quotation that went viral some years ago. But it's really helpful in terms of anchoring yourself and reminding yourself about how much you actually do know about what's going on with your organization. Um, you know a lot about what you do and who you are and what is solid. And holding on to that is really important because when we've got a lot of uncertainty around us, we tend to worry about the uncertain things. And you do know what you need to know. You might not know it, <laughs> <laughs> but you probably know somebody who could help you with that. And this is where I'm encouraging you to look outside and collaborate with people. And particularly at the minute, there is so much information being shared online, being shared through webinars. Fundraisers are actively talking to people online about what they want and what they need. Um, and locally, who's got the information on what's going on locally? You might not be able to get that information now, but knowing what you're looking for and when it might become available to you just um, settles you a bit and stops that amount of anxiety that you might have. And then the other area is the known unknowns. And this is basically your risk register. And I would just say, uh, keep it simple. Really just concentrate on the things that really can have an impact on you. These are the things that are very difficult to predict. And this is where working with the people in your organization and working as a team is really important. Keeping your organization as open as possible so people feel able to question assumptions, um, maybe question biases and decisions. Having that openness within the organization will protect you a lot from risk. And the other thing then, just to uh, complete this little bit about helping you anchor yourself, is you may have come across this before, circle of control. If anyone has done any coaching, they've probably, um, or been coached, they've probably come across this. But it's helpful both within the organization and within yourself. In terms of, you know, you've got a limited amount of energy. And how do you use that? Using it for where you can control situations is really important and where you can have influence is really important. And of course, you know things that are of concern to you, whether you move from tier one to tier three or whether you know, the vaccine gets distributed fast or slow in terms of visitor behavior when visitors feel safe to come back. Some of these things are very concerning, but you've got no control over them. So really what you want to do is you want to move more to this kind of setup where you decrease that circle of control of, of, of concern and you concern yourself and you use your energy with, in the places where you can influence or where you have control. 
So you control your decisions, how you communicate, who you work with. And sometimes you can influence things that you maybe feel like you haven't got that much control over, but you have got a chance to influence them. So it's always worth thinking about that when you're feeling a little bit perhaps overwhelmed or um, just things have got a bit too much for you. So this is the meat of uh, today's session and the bit really that uh, is going to help you recast your business plan. And what I'm suggesting here is that you start with the organization. You don't take out the business plan and start from there. And I know you all know your business plans inside out. Um, but I, the reason why I say start with the organization is that it gives you an opportunity to open up your thinking. A lot has happened over the last year and you'll have had lots of learning from what's going on. And you will have seen opportunities arise or maybe the glimmerings of opportunities arise. So it's quite a good idea to be a little bit expansive at the start um, because the business plan itself, whenever you wrote it, maybe you wrote it a year ago, maybe you wrote it even longer ago than that, um, it may just curb your thinking a little bit. And what we're doing here um, and what I'm gonna talk about now is kind of building the foundations. I always think with a business plan, you do a lot of work before you actually end up writing what you've got to do. And that work is really important. It's like looking at a building site and seeing nothing happening for months and then suddenly a building just arrives in a few weeks. Um, the foundations are really important. And what I would say, we're going to cover quite a lot in this part of the webinar. What I want to say to you is keep it simple. Not everything I'm going to say is going to be relevant to everybody. So feel free to be, to think that's not relevant to me. I don't need to worry about that. I'm throwing that out. I don't need to be concerned about that. Just concentrate on the things that are really going to be important to your organization and you. And what I'm encouraging you to do here in each of these areas is think about what has been going really well. What have you got right? And it's, it's worked for you. It's excellent. What have you done that you, if you had to do it again, you would do it differently? And what have you learned from that then? What are you going to take away from you into, from that experience into the future? And what, what's emerging? We've talked about that. What, what opportunities are emerging out of this? And what are you just going to stop? You maybe were thinking about stopping this before, but now it's time to do something, to not do something. So that's just as important as the emerging opportunities. So let's look at these in, in, in turn. Governance and leadership. Um, I don't think there'll be an organization that gets to the end of this year and thinks we have nothing to learn in terms of our governance and leadership because every single organization has had their landscape change. The landscape in which you operate has completely changed and it changed overnight. So that's a real shock to an organization. And it really gives you information, whether it was good or bad, doesn't matter how you handled it. It gave you information about your governance and it gave you information about how you lead as an organization and therefore what needs to change or equally well, what you're brilliant at. So the board, I know in small organizations, um, you, you may have needed your board much more than you would normally need them. You may have wanted them to get involved much more than they, they normally would. And you might have seen that you needed skills that you didn't have. You've never needed them before. So that will begin to help you to think about what needs to happen on the board. And you all know as well as I do that fundraisers look at your board when you're going to be going for funding applications in the future or maybe just at this moment in time. Funders are always looking at the board to see if it reflects what you're saying about your organization. So many of you would be thinking about diversifying, you know, bringing perhaps younger people, 
different people onto the board. And now might be a good time to think about how do you plan that over the next year or two? Um, some of you may need to do it faster than that. And also leadership. I think it's a great time to reflect on how things have gone and what you've learned. I mean, there's been so much thrown at the leaders of organisations this year, having to make decisions with hardly any information, um, reducing staff, choosing what skills you need to keep and what skills you're going to say goodbye to. If you're a volunteer-run organisation, some organisations just haven't had their volunteers around. They haven't, had, they haven't been able to be around. And staff being at home. So you've had an awful lot to adapt to as a leader. And I think it's worth reflecting on what you think really served you well and what didn't serve you well and what changes you want to make. I'm thinking about what kind of support you need. And I know we've got trustees of um, boards and chairs of boards with us today. So for them, it's thinking about how can you support your director or your CEO or your organization in a good way to help them through this. One thing is sure that you come out of this and thinking, I don't have all the org I don't have all the answers. And often we make a mistake when we're leading an organization thinking that we have to have all the answers. People look to you for the answers. But actually, it's really good for you to listen to others, to be able to open up and say, we don't have all the information. But here's how we're going to make this decision. And if these things change, this is how we're going to change that decision. So being a little bit more open, that might feel a little bit vulnerable, but it brings people along with you. Um, and it helps people understand how decisions are made and why sometimes they're changed at short notice. Um, so just a little bit on the, the, the top of the organization there. Your working practices, this is really about how the organization operates and how you encourage um, communication in and out of the organization, how you encourage innovation in the organization and how you partner, who do you work with and why do you work with them? Now, I know a lot of organizations, probably every organization here has changed things very fast. I mean, one of the most obvious ones is people working from home and what has that thrown up for you? And will you continue with it after this is over? Has it worked really well for you, some organizations? Or has it thrown up difficulties? Has it meant you have to um, communicate and organize in different ways? And how can you do that better to, be, um, to have a smooth running organization? how you're gathering information and who you're gathering information from so to inform your decisions. And that's all about the networks that you're building. Do you have to change that? I think there's particular importance for local, knowing the local information that's going on and being very close to that and working well with local organizations, community organizations, businesses and so on. And we met, I mentioned communications, and I think that's in and out. It's how you communicate with your staff, but it's also how you communicate with the public. And I think some small heritage organizations who maybe never needed to have a communications plan in the past realized that they really needed a means of speaking to people and telling them what was going on with their organization, keeping them up to date with what was happening particularly if you didn't choose to open again. Um, and then how you're trying out new ideas. Some of these things around um, the well-being agenda, um, uh, some of the things around using your site or your place in a different way. So there's been a complete difference in how people have used outdoor space over the last year. Will that continue? Do people value parks and um, the outdoor spaces around museums and other monuments more than they did in the past? Have you taken an opportunity to work with people perhaps on fitness programs in your outdoor space and that's something that you're going to continue? So there's all sorts of changes to your working practices that need to be considered when you're looking at your business plan. 
and then your audiences. What has happened over this last year to your audience? Um, is your core audience going to come back? Are they, have you expanded that audience? You know, I know a lot of people are trying out digital um, programs online, digital workshops, talks, events, all kinds of things. Is that expanding an audience that you want to hold on to? How are you going to hold on to that audience and bring them back into your organization if they weren't there before? And have you been teaming or are you thinking of teaming up with another organization that might help you to expand your audience? And there's something here about competitors and it's a tricky one, but weirdly a competitor of course is as close as you as you could get. Are there competitors around that are in the same situation as you that actually could be turned into collaborators that you could work with together and pool audiences? And what about stakeholders? So these are the people that you're influencing, whether it's um, your patrons who are paying you money, your members, um, the funders who, as I've said, are really listening at the moment. I think funders are beginning to realize that there's a real gap in core funding. It can't just be about project funding. Um, so the jury is out there, but there's certainly hope and how can you influence them because they are listening at the moment. And all those organizations that are membership run, so you know, the AIM, the Arts Marketing Association, um, all sorts of heritage organizations, uh, the Association for Cultural Enterprises, Museums Association, there are lots of these organizations who are doing exactly what you're doing. They're looking at their business plans and they're trying to work out what you need and how they can support you. So it's a really good opportunity to influence them by telling them what you need, telling them what kind of support you need from them. Um, so now it's a, a chance to think about how you're communicating outside the organization. So I just, I'm going to continue with this, but I'm going to go on to another slide. I really want to spend just a little bit of time on your income generation, which of course is one of the biggest things that's happened to people um, over the last year, losing so much income, um, and how that's generated from your collection, <coughs> from your site, from your program, and from your events. So this is how you deliver your purpose as well. The two things go together for heritage organizations, of course. So where things are going to be in the future and assessing how you prioritize this is going to be really important. Thinking about what is gone forever. So I mentioned earlier, there's sometimes things that we, we hang on to even when we know that they're really not serving our purpose very well. But we've got an audience that we like, perhaps. Uh, we enjoy doing it ourselves. But actually, we could be spending our time doing something that would generate either more for our purpose or more for our income. And maybe this is the opportunity to knock some of those things on the head. Um, it's given you a perfect opportunity to bite the bullet on some of these things. And maybe some of the changes that have happened over this year mean that some things you do will just be supplanted. They're just not going to come back. And so I think it's a really good idea to make a decision on that, to just say, right, we're not doing this, we're stopping doing it, end of. But as we know, a lot of the activities that you do are very much related to your visitor, to your audience, and to the people you connect with. And some of those, most of them, will come back. They will resume. It was a question of timing, probably, for a lot of it. Um, some of them might come back with not very much effort. So it's trying to work out which things will come back without too much effort and which things actually I'm going to have to do a bit of work on. So a lot of people I know um, make money from weddings. And it's been really interesting, actually, that in um, something like 70% of the weddings that were to take place up until January have been put off until 2022. 
So good news for anyone who uses their venue as a wedding venue. And actually, weddings that were taking place in 2021 have been pushed back. 90% of them have been pushed back into 2021 towards the end of next year. And there's some really interesting things happening where people are having micro weddings, those that are going ahead. So there's opportunities there for smaller venues who might never have thought of themselves as a wedding venue to become a wedding venue. Or this new thing, which is the sequel wedding. So people are getting married and then they're having their big do later on. So all kinds of things, you know, this is an area where by doing a little bit of research, you can find out what's happening with that sector. Schools is another one. I think a lot of people have seen that disappear. Some of you will have been able to create a digital program and do that. But I guess what you want to ascertain is, are your local schools thinking, brilliant, we're saving lots of money by doing digital programs, um, we're never going to go back again? Or are they saying, all our kids have been stuck in a classroom, one classroom with maybe one lab a week or something. We're dying to get our kids out into a real environment with real collections. Um, so we will be back. And if that's the case, you know, they're coming back in June or September of next year. And so you need to be ready to be marketing to them from March onwards. So now's the time to start planning for that. So knowing that information is going to be um, really important. Members, again, um, if you haven't already been in touch with your members, I'm sure you all have. Um, it's really the time to appeal to members' better nature. Um, it's so much easier to keep a member than to uh, recruit a new member, as you all know. Um, but I think there is some evidence that members are being more philanthropic than they normally would be. Normally, members are buying benefits. And I think over this last year, they've really understood your pain. And they are willing to hold on to the membership because they know that that's helping you. So making that explicit, sometimes you need to tell people that we value you um, would be really important if you haven't already done that. I know some organizations are extending their membership rather than letting people uh, leave. And so they're saying, you don't need to renew for another three or six months. Again, you're losing that three or six months, but you're actually gaining that, you're keeping that membership, which is going to be much more important. And of course, there's all of the visitor facing income that comes from your shop, from your retail, from your admissions. And as soon as we're able to socialize more and go out more, that will, you would think, come back. But what do you need to know about those audiences at the moment? And what do you need to be communicating to them? Um, and I know many of you, I know some people who've had um, online shops have done really well from that. But that won't be the case for small organizations. You really need people on the ground coming through the doors or the gate. And what are the opportunities then? Because you know, it hasn't all been bad this year. There have been things that have just come to the fore that wouldn't have come to the fore had we not had this shock. And there are some opportunities for short-term income generation that will exist next year that maybe will, will go. But there's other things that you will be able to develop for the future. So digital is the obvious one, and I know there are um, more webinars on that, but there's a lot um, of opportunity in doing certain parts of digital for income generation. Using your outdoor space, if you've got outdoor space, this is a great opportunity to capitalize on that because it still will be needed through the spring, I, I think. Um, we've already talked about the local, but um, what can you do? What sort of partnerships? There's a lovely story I heard yesterday about a little tiny museum in London called the Water and Steam Museum who couldn't open their shop, but they had a local uh, charity that helped dis disabled people um, with work experience. And they really wanted to have somewhere where they could have people have work experience of working in a shop or working in a cafe. And so they teamed up with the museum so that their people could get work experience and the shop could open and make some money. 
And it was just a real win-win situation for both those small organisations, allowing them to continue to do what they need to do. Um, there's something about small events takeover, I think, in the in this short interim period, if you're coming from a very small venue that um, can really work for you, where you can uh, let a small organization that's already meeting take over your venue and hire it for uh, a short amount of time. I've mentioned small weddings, but also on a more sober note, what some organizations or some individuals are talking about is, of course, across this year, there's been a really sad, um, circumstance where people have lost loved ones and they haven't been able to celebrate their life and what people are looking to do is use that first anniversary as a real celebration of that person's life and come together and have a party to celebrate their life so there might be opportunities there um, for people to do that in unique circumstance in, in surroundings and of course, there's been a real upsurge in hobbies. Everybody who was too busy before have uh, started going back to some of their old hobbies and they're doing that, them at home on their own. Is there a way of bringing those into your organisation, of connecting people that are resurrecting these old hobbies and making it um, a social activity? So lots to think about there and I, as I say take it uh, take the bits that are relevant to you this is another um, slide from the Indigo and Baker Richards um, research which I thought was really interesting mainly because of this area I know there are other digital workshops but this is really interesting that doing events and workshops people are willing much much more willing to pay for so they make that connection between paying for a physical event or workshop and doing it digitally. So I think that's quite heartening for a lot of organisations to uh, develop that thread of income generation into the future. I'm not going to talk too much about team because I know, as Sarah said at the start, there's a lot about, going to be a lot of workshops about well-being and so on um, with teams going forward. But I think I, all I wanted to say was that there is a lot of um, emphasis on digital infrastructure at the moment and how important that is to an organisation. And I would still say that people are your most important resource. Um, you, of course, have probably got fewer of them and you're probably asking them to do more. So those relationships with people are really important because if we're all working together, we tend to get more done. And if we've got an organisation that has openness, um, people are allowed to question and ask and contribute um, and be listened to, you get richer information back and you get better business planning. And now lastly in that series was, of course, the finances. So I imagine most of you at this webinar today have been already through cost-cutting exercises. I know a lot of organisations were doing that in the first couple of weeks of April. Um, if you haven't already, um, you certainly need to be looking at that. Um, I'm just thinking about maybe that this is not cut forever you know what are the things that you need to freeze and you can come back to when times are better and your finances are healthier um, are there opportunities like we're talking about collab i'm bringing collaboration up quite a lot are there opportunities where collaboration will share costs and bring down your costs and i know maybe slightly medium-sized organizations larger organizations what are the kind of systems that you're using, that you're paying for, that you could get together in your local area and pool? And ticketing systems really comes to mind. So many organizations paying for ticketing systems um, where they could pool that resource. Um, online shops comes to mind as well, but thinking perhaps around your collection as well, what are the pieces of infrastructure that cost you a lot of money that you really don't need to have 
only in your organization you could share, share that. So um, the other part of this is then looking at all of those income streams that we were talking about. And I think I've captured most of them. Some of these will be irrelevant to some of you, some of them uh, more relevant, maybe all of you, re maybe relevant to all of you. Um, and you're thinking about this in line with your staffing. So if you aren't making, if you haven't made staff cuts already and you're facing staff cuts, you're trying to think about what mindsets and what skills you, you need to maintain whilst also thinking about what can you buy in that you don't have to pay for every day. So we're in the position at the moment where there are a lot of very highly trained freelancers out there who can do small amounts of work for you. So, you know, fundraising certainly comes to mind. Um, paying on results for sponsorship has been done in many organizations for a long time. So thinking about what are the skills you absolutely need to pay for every day and what are the skills that you can bring in and out of your organization. Um, one thing I find when I'm working with a lot of organizations is often how they organize their finances and how they record the financial information doesn't help them when it comes to business planning. So I mean, what I mean by that is that they can't really see the true costs of various things. And so sometimes they're carrying on with um, uh, pieces of work actually that cost them much more. They think they're bringing money in, but actually they're costing them money. So it's really important to get whoever looks after your finances, organizing those figures in a way that allows you to really clearly see what the real cost is of all these different things, and then being able to make decisions and make priorities based on that. Um, often I think it's about, it tends to be where, when you've got staff covering a number of different jobs, what they're, spent, what they're spending their time on. And often with online shops, this is a, a real issue that they think organizations think they're making money, but when they look at everything, all the costs involved, they realize that they're not. Um, being aware of the investment that you're going to be putting into something, that's not to say that you shouldn't be investing on in it, but just being aware that you've got to cover that cost from somewhere going forward. And you're in, some of you will have been lucky enough to get recovery funds. So perhaps some of that can be used in seeding some of these new new opportunities that you're going to develop and those business plans that you're going to be looking at for new activities or how you're going to um, refashion yourself over the next year, that money could perhaps help you to get some of these things off the ground that are going to contribute. But I know as well, it's not just about money. It certainly is mostly about money at the moment, but it's also about the other benefits, about how you deliver on your purpose. And there may be some things that you do that are a loss leader because you're getting it back somewhere else. So I just want to make that point that it's not always um, as black and white as perhaps um, it's laid out in these little bubbles. So... Um, before, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on scenario planning, but these are the last few slides of the, uh, of the webinar. So what I'd like to invite you to do is start, if you haven't already, start popping your questions into the chat so that we can answer some of those very direct questions for you and everybody can benefit um, from your questions. So with scenario planning, and I know this is often brings a kind of cold shiver to people because they just can't help themselves thinking of all the worst situations. So what I'm suggesting here is that you take each focal issue. So that's a, focusing on the main problems or the uh, situations or decisions that you've got to make and taking them one by one. And by restricting this, you make it more effective and you save a lot of time, actually, and energy. And with what, you know, it might be income generation might be a focal issue for you, or it might be that you're facing cutting staff. Um, it might be um, changing service, which is, I know, a big one for a lot of heritage organizations at the minute. 
And then you're looking at the key factors that have a significant impact on that issue, either short term or long term. And what I'd encourage you to do is if things are highly correlated, that they move together, just put them together rather than having hundreds of or tens of uh, key factors because that will just disable you. And then what you do is you do some little scenario matrix matrices. So I've just done a, uh, an example here, um, a fictitious example. The names, what people say is um, sometimes it's easier to just call things something. So when it comes to what you're eventually going to do with your scenarios is you're going to prioritize and you're going to throw some out. You're going to ignore some. So it's sometimes helpful just to call them names or you might want to call them A, B, C, D, E, you know, it doesn't, it, whatever suits you. But this allows you to see what is really important to you and what's not important to you. And you can do these with a number of different scenarios. This is one with restricted opening, opening or not opening, and schools coming back or not coming back. And sometimes you'll see, like up here, that it has the same effect on you, actually. Uh, that probably means content distribution rather than diversifying con content. And then what you do is you take each one of those and you just prioritize them and you feed them into your business plan. So you, uh, you merge them in. So what I've been doing here is trying to give you the foundations <clears throat> that will help you renew your business plan. And what you would do at the end of this then is take the objectives of your business plan and start to adapt them, eliminate them, or even add to them based on the study of your own organization that you've done and then come up with your action plan for next year and your timetable. And I would say it again, I know I said it before, but really keep it simple. You don't need to have a business plan that's more than eight pages, six pages long, whatever, whatever. But I, I would keep it simple. Not all of this will be relevant. Throw out whatever you need to and keep hold of the things that really resonate and are important for your organization. So before we go into the questions, I just wanted to leave you with top tips. I've already, I've said it too often, haven't I? Keep it simple. Ground yourself, you know, use some of those tools to remind yourself about where you are strong, where your organization is strong, and where you don't need to concern yourself. Um, collaborate if you can, even if it is just to become more knowledgeable, but if you can cut your costs, if you can share your services, this is a great time to start collaborating. And find a way of being comfortable, uncomf uh, uh, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, because actually you always need that. We're certainly living in probably a worse time than normal at the minute. But when you're planning, you always need that. You never have all the answers. And prioritize. Ignore some things and concentrate on the things that are really going to make a difference. And I suppose more than anything, really look after your team and give yourself a break. Look after yourself. So 2020 is nearly over. It is time to look forward. And I don't think 2021 can be worse. I think it can only be better. So now we just want to finish this part with a little poll, if you don't mind, letting us know how you're feeling about your business plan now, just at this moment in time. So if we can pop the poll up. So thinking about reimagining your business plan at the minute, how are you feeling? Do you know what you have to do, number one? Has this given you some ideas, some tools, some direction to use? Do you, number three, do you really need some help with this? And number four, are you really thinking, you know what, this is all great, but I do not know where to start with this. So please tell us 
what you're thinking just now. And then we'll go on and we'll answer uh, your questions directly after this. I'll just give you a little bit of time to answer this. Okay, so if we have got most of the votes in, it'd be really nice to see where people are. Oh, well, that's very good, actually, that so many people are feeling that they know where they need to go after this. And for those of you, for the 14% of you out there, the nine answers that came in and said, look, I need some help. I really don't know where to start with this. Help is at hand. So the, there are going to be uh, business planning, one-to-one -one sessions available from um, the Heritage Alliance. And the application is open at the minute. It's open to next Wednesday, the 16th. So please, those people, everyone actually uh, could do with some one-to-one -one help, I'm sure. So please do apply for that because you'll get so many sessions that will help you specifically on your organisation and yourself. So um, I really encourage you to put an application in for that. You've got a week to do it. Okay, so... Sarah, if you're there, we'll move on and see if we've got any questions. Yes, indeed, we do. Lots of questions coming in. Thank oh, you so right. much for that, Louise. That was brilliant. Our first question is um, saying that you're absolutely right. This, this need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, but how do we bring people along with us? So how do we convince our trustees, our leadership, and make them happy to review activities that don't generate enough income or impact? So there's a few questions in that. Two parts, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so let's first just... things first was about how we convince trustees and leadership to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right. So I think this is all about, if we go back to what I was saying right at the start about showing that you do not have the information, you don't have the answers. And you know, that that's one of the few facts that we have at the moment, that we don't have that. So you're, you're always making assumptions. So I think it's bringing, it's explaining that and maybe, maybe just being really explicit about it. Because sometimes when people know that, I don't think they can argue with it, you know? Mm. So um, being really open, saying what you don't know, what you hope that you will be able to find out, and what is a risk for you. Mm. I think sharing that across the organization with trustees, because otherwise, if you don't, you can get into a situation where you're kind of, you're locked, you know, one thing thinks, why can't we move on? And the other saying, but I don't know all the information, you know. So being really explicit, I think that's probably the best way of answering that first part. Just remind me what the second bit was. Sure thing. Um, about making sure that people um, are happy to review activities that don't generate enough income or impact. So I think this is putting it in context, isn't it? So, it, it, you know, maybe this is thinking about that, organ that activity that I was saying that you're hanging on to, you know, that it's kind of that, you know, you shouldn't be doing it because it's not having as much value for the organisation. Uh, or it's not bringing in as much income for the organization and you really want to knock it in the head, but somebody has, it's somebody's pet project or somebody loves it. I think putting it in context is a really good way. Sometimes, um, sometimes going head on with something with the facts doesn't convince someone. So sometimes you have to approach it in a bit more of a roundabout way. Um, and just put it against what other things you could be doing. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, working with that person to get them to say what you know is going on, really. Asking them about which of the things they feel are delivering most for the organization when you've presented them with the intelligence or the insight. So, you know, the, there's nothing like ranking things that are having the most impact and seeing that, you know, if we've got this much resource and this much people, why are we doing this thing that's hanging down the bottom when we could be doing these things? Mm. 
And maybe there is something as well about bringing your allies along with you, you know, because it's, it's very hard for people to let go of things that they like um, sometimes, you know, so you have to help them to let go. <laughs> like helping people to let go. Um, we've got another question here about um, having, do you have any thoughts, Louise, on how one would assess for, for the purposes of financial planning, the benefits of training for staff and volunteers? So this is, you, you are wondering whether you should spend money on training. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think you need to develop people. I mean, I do. I, I, I think there's a real value in that. But it's a kind of, it's knowing, it, it's knowing why you're doing it, I guess. I mean, I, I probably need a bit more information mm. to answer that question. But if you have something, so say you are thinking of setting out to do something and you do not have the skill to do that, that is then one of your investment costs. I have to train someone in order to do this um, as always when the chips are down I think it's harder to do general training it's always the way in organizations it's really hard to do it um, but you know if it's connected to the delivery of your purpose or of bringing in income mm -hmm. it's a it's a cost then for that service so you should be doing it and just um, I'm going to take a couple of the questions that people submitted on there um, when they when they signed up to the webinar, because there's some great ones in there as well. Oh, Somebody okay. asked us, uh, uh, given everything that's going on at the moment, how far ahead it's sensible for heritage organisations to be doing this sort of business planning. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question, isn't it? I think that it's probably not to do with how far ahead, but it's more to do with flexibility. I mean, we all know that when you plan, planning for tomorrow is much easier than planning for this time next year. So as we go further and further down the line, you know, when people do five year plans, you always know. I always used to say, you know, when you get to the year three, it's kind of crystal ball uh, uh, territory, really. And that's in good times, you know. So I think it's more there's no harm in knowing where you want to be in three years time, where you want to be in five years time as your kind of goal, you know, where you want to reach. Um, but maintaining flexibility in that and being able to revisit what you are doing and how far it's getting you towards that end goal. So you might have a five year plan, but mm. you have to be very flexible the longer out you're planning. Yeah, so, the, so that those longer term plans are a bit more sort of visioning and strategy, but the short term stuff is where the nitty gritty yeah. goes. Yeah, and it's, mm. there's no harm in doing that. Our planning is a good thing to do. Um, it's just being adaptable. Yeah. And leading on from that, somebody's asking um, who should be leading on reviewing the business plan and, and why. So we look, we're talking about trustees, the CEO, senior management team together. Well, I mean, really, an organisation, the the trustees should always be signing off on strategy, I think. So, you know, where you're going and why you're doing it. But when it comes to how you do it, you would like to think the person at the top of the organisation is doing that and then agreeing it, bringing it to their board of trustees for sign off. But really, it's the organisation, I think, that needs to make that decision there they have to own it. If that comes down from the trustees, there's a chance that people will feel that they don't own it. Mm. And would you would you involve, would you it be a team activity then to review your business plan? I, I really think that's the way to do it. I mean, you have to do it carefully because if you, if people want to be involved and you do want them involved in reviewing the business plan, then they also have to come knowing they're taking responsibility. Mm. So they're taking responsibility for how they behave, what they contribute, and how they respond to that. Mm. Um, but in involving a wider team, you are getting really rich and valuable information. And you're also motivating your team. Um, you're bringing them into the inner circle about how it works. Mm. So it's really good for the organization. Yeah. No, I think that's really sensible. Somebody I used to work with kept a, an ideas folder and she kind of, she 
from everybody from volunteers and staff and visitors and anything that she thought sounded like it could be viable she stuck it in the ideas folder so when she was doing reviewing and planning she had a huge bank of um, resources and ideas um just, just one thing there I, I would say as well is there's no harm in workshopping with your trustees yeah you know as well I, you know just as you would uh, workshop with your with your team i just think where it's not a good idea is when it it comes right from the top and nobody has had a chance to contribute yeah so it's a collaborative process it's Absolutely. not yeah lovely yeah. um and then um somebody asking about the kind of the sort of scale of things because lots of the heritage organizations who are uh, participating in the rebuilding heritage program are quite small independent some of them entirely um, voluntary so thinking about how small organizations with quite limited resources can approach business planning and also this quite kind of some of these kind of quite large-scale reform ideas yeah well i mean they approach it the business planning the process of business planning in the same way as any organization would do um and again i would say just keep it really simple you know keep it down to the things that you really need to do but if you are thinking uh when i when you say large scale uh change i'm thinking they're really thinking but maybe we need to change what we're doing or we need to rethink our our vision you know then i i think that should be something that is done across the organization as well mm. and maybe and you need to you know talk to sometimes stakeholders outside your organization as well if you think that you need that external view it depends what you're doing yeah but, yeah and this, this is also where i am i'm, I'm afraid i'm going to do another plug for the program to say if, if you are um, a heritage organization who's really struggling to identify how you start the process of reviewing your business plan or for some organizations writing a business plan then then please please do apply um as louise said our deadline is the 16th of december so next week um, and that will be for business planning as well as the other types of support taking place in january and february yeah absolutely i think the thing is that this is unique to every organization so you know the person who asked that question about large-scale thing has something going on in their head mind. There. and that, there's where one-to-one -one support can really really help look underneath what's going on and help them with that yeah and um i've got a, an interesting question here louise about how you kind of balance between the planning and and then the kind of impatience to get going with something so what should be your your approach for um the kind of the thinking time versus the doing well um uh, i mean you're going to be mostly doing aren't you you know that is the thing but i i think you you don't want to uh make this into you know a, an event that goes on forever really you know you do want to be fairly sharp about it and also uh energized about it you know so that's where i say concentrate on the things prioritize and concentrate on things that are really going to make a difference otherwise everyone will get very tired talking about it you know so i uh, you know pick a time schedule it out and do keep it simple but do it well uh but don't draw it out too much i would say mm. and you know all organizations end up being a little bit you know they're sailing the ship and they're painting the side of it at the same time so you know you always end up doing a little bit of that uh you're doing both really but mm. um yeah I, I wouldn't draw the process out too much no and um we so the rebuilding heritage program um so that everybody in attendance is aware is open to sole traders and freelancers um for the application process so um i just we've got a question that came in in advance from somebody who's a consultant working with heritage organizations and they're thinking about their future developments and wanted to know how they what what can they do to better understand and support the business planning activity of the heritage organizations they work with well i suppose when you come in as a consultant you've got that great freshness so you can help them question their assumptions sometimes mm. which a thing that organizations find really hard to do themselves just by the very nature you know of having to be very certain about where you're going having to know what you're doing it's sometimes really hard to then sit down and question that <laughs> 
But a consultant, on the other hand, can look at you and ask you to question your biases, question why you don't do that. Why do you not work with that organization down the road? You know, have you talked to somebody about sharing services? They can ask sometimes what might be difficult questions and help the organization to raise their awareness of opportunities that they might just not be able to see. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The kind of you can't undervalue the importance of a fresh set of eyes sometimes and yeah. a different a different way of thinking. Yeah. So well, I'm going to take the the um, final question. So um, is just if you were going to advise one thing that everyone should do after watching this webinar to improve their business planning, what's their what's their one takeaway, Louise? Oh my word! Question. That is really mean. I think. You know what? It's not a thing to do, but I think, I really do think you have to be comfortable knowing that you do not know all the answers. Be comfortable making your best estimate with the information you have and then willing to change your mind mm. when new information comes along. Yeah. So you have to be quite dynamic, but a little bit uncomfortable. And I think speaking from personal experience, I would say that is where the, some of the smaller heritage organisations who might feel perhaps that they're at a disadvantage actually have, have a real benefit there because they can move quickly and they can change plans. They can try something out and if it doesn't work, pivot to something else. So I think, you're, yeah, I think your advice is spot on. And I think I, I, there's, for me, I think very hard to identify one thing because I feel like there's a lot of really good takeaways um, from today's session. And for anybody who is, um, I, we've had some questions throughout Louise saying, will this be made available? Yes, it absolutely <laughs> will. Um, we will be making it available on our website, which is www.rebuildingheritage.org.uk. Um, we hope that you have all found today's session helpful. Um, and please do, as you're leaving the, the webinar, you'll find that a feedback form um, will pop up after the session, but we will also email it to you if you're not able to fill it out immediately. We do really appreciate everybody's um, answers and really honest answers because it's helping us to plan the future training and support. And also just a final reminder, we are currently open for applications on the Rebuilding Heritage Programme. You can apply for up to eight hours of business planning consultancy. You can apply for media and communications strategy session and a follow-up support session. You can apply for fundraising consultancy. You can apply for rebuilding leadership training and managing well-being training. You can apply for all of those. You can apply for one you can apply for any that you feel are relevant to you there is one application form that covers all the types of support and we've tested it out ourselves we reckon it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to fill out and then once you've completed it you will hear from us quite quickly to find out whether or not you are successful because the support is to take place in January and February next year so thank you all so much for attending. Get your applications in by 11 p.m. on the 16th of December. And I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Louise.